Let's see. We're going to go ahead and get started then. Um, my name is Adam McGee. It's such a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, I'm one of the, I am the arts editor for Boston Review. Um, I help run a project called Arts and Society. And it's a delight to be here tonight also with another um, of our arts editors at the magazine, Eve Lisa Rodriguez, with whom I'm gonna be sharing um, co-hosting duty tonight. Uh, so it's really such a delight to have um, seven amazing readers from this year's uh, annual arts issue, which is called Ancestors, uh, which came out a little bit earlier in the year. But <clears throat> because of COVID and everything, uh, it's just been a little bit kind of slow um, doing promotional events for it, but we're really happy that tonight has worked out so well. Um, I just wanna say a little bit about the Arts and Society project um, before we get started. Um, we really try to focus with it on a very kind of specific band of arts publishing, um, which looks at how the arts can speak to the most pressing political and civic concerns that we are facing, including racism, inequality, poverty, demagoguery, sex and gender-based violence, uh, a disempowered electorate, a collapsing natural world, and this is a mission that dovetails with Boston Review's overall uh, goal, which is to help our readers um, have a better sense of what it means to be empowered as citizens um, and how they can participate in our democracy. Uh, for Arts and Society, we publish new poetry free on our site uh, most Fridays. And we also publish new fiction and criticism at least a couple of times a month. Uh, everything on our site is free. It's always going to be free. Uh, but we do publish these annual themed literary anthologies, uh, such as Ancestors, which looks at like this. Um, my colleague, Dan Manchin, is going to post a coupon code and a store link uh, in the chat right now um, that you can use to get 30% off of Ancestors if you're still looking to get an issue. You can give it as a gift if you already have one. Um, and uh, we also publish other um, nonfiction books three other times a year. Um, a lot of them are on left-leaning politics and philosophy, um, such as our book on anger, which the New Yorker named one of the best books of 2020. Um, and lastly, before I hand things over to Ibelise, um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and also thank all of the people who made generous donations in support of tonight's event. It's such a big help um, to us to have that support. Uh, and if you are interested in making a donation of any amount, um, Dan is gonna post a link in, in the chat that goes to our donation page. Um, and now I'm going to switch these pins around so that uh, Evelise can talk. Okay. So um, in addition to our annual print issue, Arts and Society also hosts annual poetry and fiction contests, which are free for people to enter if they live outside of the US, Canada, or Western Europe, or are experiencing hardship. Uh, this year's theme for both contests is the idea of repair. With the poetry being judged by Sonia Sanchez and the fiction is being judged by Kali Fajardo Einstein, the revenue we get from selling our books and running our contests helps with the cost of our programming. But most of our support is from our members, donors, and charitable, charitable grants. If you enjoy this event tonight, please pop over to our website, bostonreview.net, to enjoy all the free content and consider helping out by becoming a member. Make a donation of any size or buying a book. Each ancestor's contributor will read this evening for eight minutes. We ask our readers to be mindful of the clock so that there's plenty of time for everyone. Because time is short, we will also be keeping the author bios brief, but you can find full bios on the event page. It's also a pleasure to introduce our ASL interpreters for this evening, Susan Pacheco-Corea and Selena Flowers, 
who works with the organization Pro Bono ASL, which works to provide free and low cost ASL interpreting for activists and nonprofit organizations. The auto captioning feature on Zoom is turned on and can be accessed from the button in the bottom toolbar. In addition, we are putting in chat a PDF of all of this evening's readings so that you can have them up on your screen or however works for you. Okay. Um, we're just working out um, the uh, technical details for <laughs> the, uh, the posting of the file. For some reason, we're having some issues. So within a couple of minutes, we should have that in the chat. Um, but in the meantime, it's my pleasure to introduce our first reader for this evening, Duena Fulwiley, who is an anthropologist of science and medicine, whose fieldwork with scientists, patients, and larger publics explores the interplay of genetics and cultural politics in Senegal, France, and the United States. Um, she is the author of The Enculturated Gene, Sickle Cell Health Politics and Biological Difference in West Africa, uh, as well as numerous articles on ancestry genetics in the United States. And uh, she teaches at Stanford University. So I think she is unmuting. Yes. Thank awesome. you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, great. So it's just such a pleasure to be here with all of these amazing writers. And I just feel so honored to be part of this um, arts anthology. So let me just get started in the interest of time. My piece is called, my longer piece, I'm just going to read excerpts. My longer piece is called DNA in our 21st century ancestors. So here goes. Some of my ancestors might live just up the street. They are the people who own the black camper van with the decal brandishing the words Irish pride. I pass their house on my walks, a little unsure where ethnic importance might blur into white nationalism, even in the hills of Oakland, California. The sticker, a simple block design in green and white, joins the two potentially menacing terms in a crossword. The middle eye hinges them in a calm clover colored Celtic cross that sends my brain thinking of meadows to flee the idea of possible racial hatred. Lightly freckled with age bleached red hair like my mother, the man recently waved to me from, several car, from one of several cars parked on their auto-filled lot where the couple has taken to hanging out on sunny afternoons during COVID. One tribe down, hundreds, possibly thousands more to go. The next most obvious might be the Yoruba, somewhere among the people on my dad's side. One who arrived from Lagos a few years ago is a friend who lives down the hill in the flats they refuse to choose a gender and are on to bigger issues like devising an AI to catalog and then create 3D replicas of all the stolen African artifacts in the British Museum. What if my middle-aged self-affirming Irish American neighbors had lived in Salt Lake City, Utah as children with parents who were willing to be sampled for a 1980s French study that went on to furnish so-called European DNA to scientists around the world for decades to come? What if my Nigerian friend, whose father is a transnational virologist, was one of the Yoruba chosen for the International Haplotype Map Project that took genetic material for a global database from families beginning in 2002 and are still used in the present? These contemporary humans could very well have been counted among the reference samples that have now become entrenched as genetically ancestral for people who purchase DNA tests, such as those offered by companies like Ancestry.com and 23andMe. Sales of the direct-to-consumer kits 
now make up a multi-billion dollar industry that has tested millions of people, 28 million on my last count, giving them ancestry results like 63% Irish, 37% Yoruba. The point is, there is nothing inherent in who my prideful neighbors or my smart friend are as people that would exclude their DNA from the stores of biological raw material used to manufacture the modern day product called genetic ancestry. My friend and the Irish of the street are intricately bound up with complex identities, passions, existences like the rest of us. They too, in Whitman's words, contain multitudes that cannot be reduced to genetic sequences fixed in antiquated time. Ancestry paintings, as one company calls the display of its autosomal test results, take different forms. A common feature of these paintings is that they attempt to convey the onlookers intimate belonging to the world's people through colorful maps with clear arrows indicating relations to distant lands alongside lists of scribed identities that combine to signify the past, spatially and temporally. Outside of labs, however, the ancestors continue on with their diverse, unpredictable, and very 21st century preoccupied lives all around us. As an anthropologist, I have spent the last two decades studying how geneticists' beliefs and cultural ideas shape how they draw up the scientific world, both for themselves and for larger publics. One of the immediately striking aspects of autosomal ancestry testing among everyday people is the emphasis on, well, ancestors. When I've given public talks, one thing is clear. People most often think that the DNA tests they buy are telling them something about long ago human DNA, bits of themselves they feel are directly shared with people from another time. There is a look of disbelief and a lot of questions that follow when I tell them that most often their DNA is being compared to plain old humans in the here and now. I call these unknown assumed ancestors the today people to cut through the many layers of confusion that ancestry testing has created for consumers to sift through. The today people are individuals who, withstanding the possibility of recent death, are currently busily alive in the same ways we are. The today people are conceptually cast as past when geneticists perform a simple speech act of pronouncing them to be so. For anyone interested in what these tests might provide them, it is important to keep in mind that they only analyze small quantities of human biological material that companies selectively compare and curate when, when looked at against ours. Ours meaning those of us in the quote, new world. Those seem to be fundamentally mixed in ways the ancestors who are imagined to be more naturally pure are not. Direct-to-consumer testing is largely designed for the mutts of modern history. The us, the mutts, are the countless who come to testing for motives too numerous to catalog, for reasons tied to the violence of this country's colonization. Many have no paper trail, linking us to the varied strands of our origins. We can't get back the lands, kin, loves, and life that European colonialism and Western imperialism ripped away. Our government has largely refused to entertain substantial land back requests of Native Americans and refused to discuss the consistently tabled HR 40, a bill to simply consider what reparations for US slavery might entail. We cannot recuperate, even in these small gestures, what conquest and racial bondage took. In light of these losses, ancestry testing itself may be a form of virtual restitution, a phantom of human remains handed back, handed back to the progeny 
since the much higher value goods of countries, territory, lifeways, and lives themselves are out of the question for return. If many people actually desire the return of these things, then what work is commercial DNA testing actually doing? In some ways, it recreates the past in a much more appealing televisual technicolor, a beautified, streamlined, open-ended cinematic landscape that can offer those dispossessed a slightly more palatable, if still haunted, human history. It evokes stories of profound human intrigue, of skin tones and facial features, of tribal names and exotic plains, of massive migrations, and specifically named homelands. Any individual whose imagination is roused is invited to be part of familiar, romantic, and even tragically compelling scripts. Humans are rightly moved by the perspectival lines and framed composition of ancestry painting. The reconstruction of one's ancestors inspires a feeling of largeness, of humanistic possibility, understandably. Ancestry in these terms is art as science. As a form of inventive expression molded by human hands, DNA ancestry shows that culturally, science too contains multitudes, just like us or our neighbors up the street. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doina. That was amazing. Let me move the pins around here. <laughs> okay. All right, Ivelisse, I think you're all set. Okay, great. Um, so my next reader is Raquel Goodison, who's on faculty at the City University of New York. Her stories, poems, and creative nonfiction have been nominated for the push cart and can be found in such literary journals as Obsidian, Pleiades, Your Impossible Voice, Quaily, Her Kind, and Drunken Boat. Her chapbook, Skin, was the winner of the 2015 Creative Justice Press Fiction Chapbook Competition. Am I up? Oh. Hi. So I'll just get right to it because I think I am pretty tight for time. Starting my timer. Skylarking. And this is a short story, but I'm only reading the first four pages, well, three pages. Skylarking. The second time Ansel's picture appeared in the Gleaner, his mother blocked his path with her big body. She tried preventing him from riding his beloved bike, even if just with friends. Every time she noticed he was dressed for sport, she'd head for the door. Ansel hated this new obstacle to the outside world. He hated even more the accompanying lectures about the dangers of life. He was already 21. He did not need to hear her sighs and her grumbles, her saying, I don't know why you have to live so. Why you want me to go to an early grave? Are that you want? Why you have to carry on, so he'd sigh. And his father might add, make the boy go have some fun, Dorcas. But they knew it came down to getting past her and it would take some doing. Why you can't stay a yard, Ansel? Why you love to gallop on, so she press. I have my life, mama. I can't stay in the house like some rat. Are that you want for me? I don't know why you forgot about so is all. Use everything to us, you know. I know, Mama, he'd say, but when we get to decide on that, what me get to decide, he'd think and never want to say out loud. He would feel a stabbing pain in his chest as his annoyance rose, but he could not bring himself to argue too much with her. Oh no. Might have lost Raquel. <clears throat> she Raquel. meant so much to him. It would hurt even at his age. As oh no. Uh, hi, no, Adam. Yeah, go ahead. I think we lost you for just a minute, but you're back now. 
I'm sorry. Instead, no, no, he put a smile on, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Instead, he put a smile on and hugged her tight. He would sigh again. This time, in, she would sigh again. This time, into his shoulder. He was that much taller than her. Then beg him as he walked out. Please don't kill me today with any foolishness. By foolishness, he thinks she meant chances with his life, as if he was not a top-ranked cyclist known for his deft skills during the steep downhill races that sometimes happened in the hills of St. Andrew. On the front page of the Gleaner, he'd appeared in his striped bicycle shorts and shirt and matching cap, his legs still on the pedals as if he was in mid-cycle. What chances did she think he was taking? And today, did he even look as if he was going racing? He felt good in his new clothes that he had bought with his last winnings. From the baby blue bush jacket to the dark blue polyester pants, everything was brand new and crisp. And though his white leather shoes were not new, they had been polished to an even brighter shine than the day he had seen them in the store. Anybody with eyes could see that Ansel was going out on the town. He was heading out to take the Sunday morning train from Kingston to Montego Bay. It was the end of last, his last free summer, that special time between his recent graduation from the university and the beginning of his life as a professional man, a time that was an ending and a beginning. He had raced every chance he could and made a decent amount of change, enough to help his parents a bit and to also give himself some spending money before his free paper bun. He had earned this break, this summer and this day out. Ansel was not about getting the, beating the clock when he went out the door. Today he was about skylarking and did not need his mother to try to make him feel bad about having little life while he could. At the train station, he tugged on the hem of his shirt and smiled at the thought of seeing Benson and Nigel again. He had met them first in first form of high school and they had become fast friends. They were all bookish boys who were obsessed with ska and soccer. Benson and Nigel had lived with their respective aunties while they went to school in Kingston and were as serious about their grades as Ansel was. Their studies were tied to their family's well being as much as it was to their own. Any failure would be beyond some personal disappointment. They were all only children as well, and it was as if their circumstances had made them brothers, the best of brethren from the minute they'd met. After their A levels, they had parted ways only so far as miles go. Ansel had gone on to the University of the West Indies. Benson had gotten a job with a bauxite mining company near his mother's house in St. Anne, and Nigel was teaching at a secondary school in Manchester where his folks lived. The Miles did nothing to diminish their connection, however. They wrote often and sometimes they would find a way to spend some time together, like they used to, if either Ansel went to the north coast of the island or they came to Kingston. It had been over a year since he'd seen them last though, because he'd been so busy studying and then racing to, found, to fund his one last relatively free summer. Ansel looked around at the rest of the crowd waiting for the train. There were more people there than he thought there would be even on this Sunday, many more. But it should have been expected. For months, the Holy Name Society of St. Anne's Roman Catholic Church had been advertising the day trip from Kingston to Montego Bay. It was in the paper, on the radio, on all over the streets in conversations and flyers. A day to remember, a bashment of the best sort, wear your best and come celebrate the last summer of the summer of 57. Come one, come all. Ansel had of course seen and heard and even talked about this trip, but he was not a church man and between studying for his exams to finally qualify as an accountant, finally completing his degrees so he'd be set for life, life as a working man who could support his parents, he had not thought much about buying a ticket or about the fact that his day trip was on the same day as this grand affair. It had been a long road to the summer and with his father no longer able to support him and his mother since his hands got too stiff to make shoes, Ansel wanted more than anything to finally get the, get the piece of paper, that degree that would set him on his way to adding to the household instead of still being one more expense to manage, one more future barely hanging in the balance. All around him, the sun bounced off the bright clothing of the hundreds of people dressed to the nines, the plump light brown girl in the yellow polka dot dress and green patent leather shoes, the man in his crisp beige short sleeve shirt and matching pants with a crease so sharp it looked like it was made of something harder than cloth. The children dressed as if they were going to Christmas service instead of a day in Mobay. Ansel felt the sweat trickled from the top of his head. He was wearing a straw hat with a small brim, but the heat of this last weekend of August reminded him they were still in the midst of hurricane season. Not even his family made hat could combat the weather. 
As he swiped the sweat from his brow, he felt the wind announce the approach of the train, and soon he heard it chug, al chug along the tracks and roll to a stop for all to board. The train, like so much of this day, was spruced up, a new diesel engine and extra cars for the bigger crowd. To Ansel, all things about this day seemed new and built for better times. Oh my God, thank you so much, Raquel. It's amazing. Um, let me, if I'm making sort of slack jawed faces here, it's because I'm moving pins around, which is also uh, to say that you should make sure that you have the speaker view rather than the grid view. Um, that way um, you will always be seeing the speaker next to um, our ASL interpreter um, and um, otherwise you'll just be kind of seeing um, everyone. So let me just find day here, here we go. Um, it's such a pleasure to introduce our next reader, uh, Day Heisinger Nixon, who is a poet, an essayist, an interpreter and a translator raised in an ASL English bilingual home in Fresno, California. Day holds an MA in Deaf Studies from Gallaudet University and is a current MFA candidate in creative writing at New England College. Their work has been published or is forthcoming in Apogee, Foglifter, Booth, and elsewhere. They live in Los Angeles. Thanks so much, Day. Hello, everybody. Um, so um, before I begin, I just want to do a, a quick visual description for the sake of access. Um, so if uh, I'm a white person, I have um, some dangly earrings with some uh, strawberries on them. I'm wearing a black turtleneck um, and a red bandana on my head um, that is covering a light brown mullet. Um, I have behind me um, projected a, um, an artistic rendering of a toilet by Do Ho Sa, who is a Korean artist. Um, it's, it's like a, made of textiles of some sort, some polyester material. Um, and so yeah, uh, what I'm gonna be reading today comes from a series um, inspired by the existence of um, this historical figure, public universal friend, who um, was born in 1752 um, and who in, in their 20s um, contracted typhoid fever um, and is reported to have died and been reborn as a genderless evangelist uh, prophet of sorts. Um, so, um, a lot of people have interpreted this person as being a historical transfigure of sorts. They, they adopted a new name, um, Public Universal Friend, and did not use gendered pronouns. Um, and this is in the, the 1800s, more or less, uh, 1700s, I suppose. Um, so I'm considering in these poems uh, a sick trans American uh, ancestry. Let me just pull out my stuff, okay. Room, room, room in the many mansions of eternal glory for thee and for everyone. When the friend emerges, the, sorry, uh, the archangels to public universal friend upon the friend's first death. When the friend emerges, they refuse a name and report they have died at least once. The doctor, God of the bone hammer and other phalluses says, no, 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 that's just the decaying room. In America, we have bones and kidneys and other things we pay to see. My doctor, the conceptual artist, presents the bones in your body are grinding together and I applaud in the examination room. Wary of the doctors, the apple prays, please denude me and I help her slip from her thin skin. My grandma has thin skin and fainting spells and calls to confirm my symptoms from the waiting room. Wary of herself, my grandma pleads to the doctor through a child's child, tell me who I am. 
The child's child talks low, does not give on to the doctor, considers this a form of making room. Back on earth, God of the bone hammer and other phalluses, Wikipedia's collagen to determine the cause of the fainting spells says, the tests are boring for everyone. You'll just be taking room. LA is a place where you can choose one age and be it forever. I choose to be root rot old and pass the long horned, long horned bees into the long grained grass, which makes way to a long forsaken room. The patterns on my jeans and on my mother's are a bit derivative. Once, while napping along the shore of a river, I dreamt of a river only to find myself upon, impossibly redundant upon waking. Rumi writes, the wound is the place where the light enters you. Light writes her name on all that has been forced to lose its own. Light loves the room, lays her palms along her ribs breaking room. This next poem is public universal friend adopts a more androgynous appearance wearing long clerical robes sporting a wide wide brimmed beaver hat outdoors. The dress does not make me the thing but I don't wear the dress too much anyway. In the poem I can hold the dress with these hands which is more than I can say for the hands. I write, excuse me, nurse, I've got blood on my dress. I write, excuse me, sir, I've got blood. Cole Swenson writes, the man born with two left hands is born a grown man. The man born with his hands full of hands later died. I was born an ungrown man, which is to say I will later die, but who knows how or how soon I know. Some people are born with too many pieces, some with too little. I am fortunate to understand my body in appropriate quantities. I imagine my hands similarly. I throw one up to hail a bus and become a sail, or is it assailed? In my notes, I write, write only about the material conditions of your life. In my notes, I write, don't get too caught up in the specifics of the body. As a child, I sleep with both of my shoes on for fear of fires. I, the child in post house fire drag. I, a child born in a country of running, but not a child of running. I throw up the other hand and they see a grown man. The hands of the tail do not matter, nor do their dual leftedness, nor does their dual leftedness. The hands spoon sugar and talk about their impossible falsification. Only the skull belongs to history, they say, only the femurs. The hands weave each disc through the windows of the linen abode draping my body, and the body remains unmetaphored. Across the screen, a client says, sorry, but a client asks, are you a man or a woman? A client smiles into my grown manhood, says, thank God, says, women never interpret for me correctly. Have you ever considered joining the military? In uniform, your girlfriend won't be able to stop herself from fucking you. On the phone, a covered California representative listens to me talk and then apologizes for calling me, ma'am, sorry, sir, sorry, ma'am, sorry, nurse, but I've got blood on my dress. Sorry, sir, but I've got blood. It's dripping through my hands, through their dual leftedness. I'm getting, it's getting on the dress. Please save the dress. I don't know how to talk about the thing without the dress. Please save the thing and its dress. It's all that's left. Thank you all. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Let me. Just move some pins around here. Okay. Okay. Please go for it. Okay. Our next reader is Wiela Baluleki, who holds a master's in creative writing from the university currently known as Rhodes. Shortlisted for the Brunel University African Poetry Prize in 2014. She is author of the chapbook. Things We Lost in the Fire. Thank 
thank you so much. Um, all right. Um, evidence, personal effects, a purse full of black. My tooth is so honest, it aches. A howl swarming the bone, a daylight in the body, a fence trying to pursue a better body for herself. I wonder if a stronger woman can grow into the gap she will leave behind. And what if all she leaves behind is a purse full of black and more self-pity? And maybe we are not meant for very beautiful things like teeth. People tell me that I am most beautiful when I smile. I smile most when I am tired. To gain control over my life in public, I smile. A father is an army or a father is a war. And during the war, the carpet is maroon and you are eight or 12 or 16 and only the adults stand in the windows. You are only a daughter, so you walk on the bones in your belly to avoid being seen. The carpet files its nails on your skin. You clean the carpet on your knees because the war does not believe in vacuum cleaners. Perhaps you do not own a vacuum cleaner. I cannot know anymore when I am telling a lie. The house is always clean. You are always fed. You and your sister play quietly until bedtime from the bedroom to the kitchen, from the kitchen to the bathroom, from the bathroom to the lounge. You do not look your father in the eyes. You do not talk back, especially you must not ask the father if God exists, because that is the kind of shit you ask your teachers. When you cry and the war tells you to stop crying or it'll give you something to cry about, you listen and build in yourself a wall so high the sky cannot get in, cannot flood you with anything, not daylight or rain or love. One day, when you are still a girl, the father hits you on the hand with a belt and you do not cry. When you do not cry, father asks you if you think you are a woman now. To get from the woman to the daughter, he breaks the skin some more. And when you cry, you are his girl again. Curiosity is blasphemous. Are you listening? I need help defending my words. I need help to say that sometimes I look in the mirror and wonder if there is another woman in the seams and will not she live my life for me? Will not she smile for me? Why, why not? Why will not the body let us lie? I am born so many times. First I am a girl, then a teacher puts soap in my mouth for saying a black word and then I am black. One day when I am black and one day when I am a black girl and know what to do to keep the soap out of my mouth, my body breaks and bleeds out of spite. My aunt, who has always been a black woman, tells me how to wash out the blood, but I cannot wash the pain of the blood. That must stay. This is woman's work. My aunt tells me to stay away from pleasure, from chocolate and white pants and boys. And for a time, I am convinced that pleasure will make me look fat, so I do not allow myself to be touched. I am a black woman then. When I am a black woman, I let men touch me because it is one way to remain untouched. I let men touch me because I am a woman who loves women and some of the men in my country will kill you to make you a woman they can love. That is how we love each other here. Pop quiz. If each time that I am born, I give up my freedom, what am I? My canines are sharp. Someone says, why do you need such sharp teeth? The way that people who think they are revealing something to you ask. For people, I say, I'm sharpening my mouth to break through the skin of the emptiness into which I rise to make sure the body does not come down, stuff the open spaces with food. Someone measures, measures the wrists 
the bracket, the proof, the nod, the obedient government of hand? Do other women know to want a body so small it fits around the horizon of an index finger and a thumb? Have you tried shaking hands with a woman that is dissolving? No one tells you that it is okay to be a color without light, the thing being born through the thing that is already alive, that you must bear the screen and know that you are coming. In every poem, I am trying to ask a question about murder. If I am not touched, how can I know that I am alive? If my father spends days not speaking, not dying, is he alive? If I kill myself, will I go to hell? My father fetches the years from the east to the west. My father is a railway man, then a policeman, then a man. But before my father is a man, he gives me his east and west to pay for a top row of beautiful teeth. A beauty so crowded it takes years to make straight. Beauty hurts from the time I am 12 until I am 17. My mother says that I needed the braces, that without them I would have had an underbite, a face with a drawer always open. Who loves a thing that is always waiting to be filled? In this new face, I can hide my want. In this face, I look like other girls, shut in and famished without hunger. This body is work. This body is a needle looking for damage. Okay, I think I'm gonna read one more poem. <laughs> oh, I think I have one minute. Okay, this is Ode to the River. Did you hear about the river that drowned in a bath? She was bent at the eyes with a spine only a hole could dress. In my culture, we keep our shadows in the water. Ah, uh, that is the end of my time. No, you're, and I need you're to be okay. Should we're, I continue? Yeah, please go, keep going. We're running a little bit late, so you're fine. Okay. Um, did you hear about the river that drowned in a bath? She was bent at the eyes with a spine only a hole could dress. In my culture, we keep our shadows in the water. What would you like me to forget? In a famous photograph, a river made homeless burns the basin looking for its family. In my culture, we keep our water in the women and drink until we are empty. He spat on me. Sometimes I am ashamed that I am too much a museum of floods. What God has put together, man turns into sin. I always wanted to be someone, I always wanted someone to have control over me, like glass. In the bath, I sink like soap. The sky makes itself as tender as the ocean, drinks until it drips. That is where its blue comes from. And the river, being a smaller sky, is as doomed as glass. He spat on me. A river cannot be lifted from the bath by an ambulance and black women have to die to be named. My father's champagne glass slips out of my hand and sweetens the floor. It is strong enough to cry. And did anyone ever tell you that you have the kind of face that makes paper beautiful? What God has put together, man puts in a vase, run, run, Forget your duty. We pity the woman who borrows her neck to the man she loves. We pity our mothers for marrying. We love our fathers. It is summer and the bones in our sugar have hardened. They tell you that if you are strong enough to give your songs away, then you are strong enough to take them back. He actually spat on me. They do not tell you what to do when your children look like you. Thank you so much. Sorry. No, there's nothing, nothing to talk about. We were running a few minutes behind. Let me just move these around here. 
I also, I, I am on a learning curve. And so it seems like I may have just actually figured out how to really pin it. So everyone sees it. So I apologize, but um, all right. Eva <laughs> <Yes. to> <laughs> okay. Our next reader is Deborah Taffa. She's a citizen of the Quatsan Nation, Yuma Indian. She has writing in dozens of outlets, including PBS, Salon, Huffington Post, the Rumpus, Brevity, A Public Space, and the Best American Series. Her memoir manuscript won the SFWP Literary Award in 2019. She teaches at Webster University and Washington University in St. Louis. Thank you, Ivelisse. Thank you. Thank you, Adam and the Review for hosting us tonight and to everyone who came out to support us. Um, I'm happy to be holding space with so many brilliant writers and their ancestors tonight. I'm reading from a winding essay that's titled The Millions. And the excerpt is from the essay's opening, uh, which means I don't have to explain too much except to say that I'm with my partner in Peru just a couple of days after breaking my wrist, like badly, a, a dinner fork fracture, and the doctor did not have time to set it in a cast before leaving on the trip. When we arrived at our temporary home in Cusco, we were greeted by a middle-aged woman who said she was the owner. She spoke to us in rapid fire Spanish until she realized I wasn't keeping up. I thought you were a local, she said, switching to English. I was flattered, watching as she flipped through our passports to check us in. After taking down our information, she handed the passports back and doubled down on her impression of me. Your husband looks North American, she said, but your dark hair fooled me. I didn't want to be rude. So I held my tongue and instead of saying anything, raised my eyebrow at Simone. He's from Milan, Italy, yet I was the one with a thousand year family history in the United States who didn't fit her notion of what its citizens look like. I'm Native American, I explained, using the vaguest of terms to locate my ethnicity for her. I might have said, that I was an enrolled member of the Quetzal Yuma Nation, but making such a statement would undoubtedly have led to further questions. And once I started explaining, where would it end? Yes, really, I was born on the Fort Yuma Indian Reservation, but our name for ourselves is Quetzal. No, really, we're not related to the Quechua people of Peru, despite the fact that the spelling is very similar. In fact, we're different linguistic groups entirely. Once those facts were established, I would feel the urge to clarify that I'm also Laguna Pueblo because my grandmother was from Coati, New Mexico, and she met my Quetzal grandfather in Indian boarding school. I would explain that the US government only allows natives to enroll in one tribe and finish by adding that my mother was born in Socorro, New Mexico to mixed race parents, part indigenous and part Hispanic. My chattiness, once I got started, would be embarrassing and it usually ended with me feeling like I had somehow overshared. The hotel owner, rather than asking the question, what tribe or mentioning the existence of a Cherokee grandmother said something I had never heard before, a statement that shocked me. She said, you must be a millionaire. I mean, thanks to your casinos. I was too tired to engage and instead opted to shake my head and give a lighthearted laugh. There are 574 tribes in the United States alone. Few people realize that each of these tribes had its own language, traditions, religious beliefs, and life ways. My Quetzal ancestors, for example, were water people, fishermen, and farmers who wore their hair in river dreadlocks 
rather than braids. They came from the shores of the Colorado River, very close to where it rushed into the Gulf of California and the Sonoran Desert before the building of so many dams. They were described by early explorers as a family of giants. The Gulf of California divides my desert homeland in half. The states of Arizona in the United States and Sonora in Mexico to the east, Southern California and the Baja California Peninsula to the west. The surface area of the Gulf of California is the same size as the Sonoran Desert itself, which means our territory is half marine. My ancestors were born swimmers in the only North American desert that is also maritime. My ancestors also lost everything during the gold rush when mining technology grew more sophisticated and settlers began to prowl the state with greed. Despite federal efforts to uphold the signed treaties and protect indigenous lands, the gold miners organized Sunday shoots in which white vigilantes would attack villages, killing as many people as they could in order to clear the land. The fact that I'm alive at all, given what my ancestors went through, feels like a statistical oddity escaped from a nightmare full of bleeding bodies and shallow graves. But I didn't tell the hotel owner any of this. Instead, Simone and I disentangled ourselves from her, took our keys and headed to our room. Once inside, I sat on a chair while he helped me take off my boots. Don't let her bother you, he said, knowing how a small microaggression could spiral into a mood. Thank you. Oh my God, thank you so much, Debra. Let me move some pins around here. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, it's such a pleasure to introduce our next reader, uh, Kyoko Uchida. Oh, hold on a minute. Let me change the, uh, the pins here for our interpreter. Okay. Uh, it's such a pleasure to introduce Kyoko Uchida, who was born in Japan and raised there as well as in the United States and Canada. Her poetry collection, Elsewhere, was published in 2012 by Texas Tech University Press, and her poetry, prose, and translations have appeared in journals including Georgia Review, Prairie Schooner, and North American Review. She works for a nonprofit organization and lives in Brooklyn, New York. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm really grateful to the Boston Review and to Adam and Nicholas for this opportunity. The first poem is called Breath. One. The story goes, when sun and moon married. Can you hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry. Breath. One. The story goes, when sun and moon married, to, pe to people the string of Sorry, to people the string of seed pearl islands as they'd seeded the sky with cold hard stars. After circling her husband to be seven rotations mincing the hour, the bride spoke first. Perhaps she merely said, let me catch my breath. Yet because of her breach of decorum, their first child was born a leech without limbs or vertebrae, just a hungry mouth, was cast away from these jade green shores on a boat of woven reeds. Seven times, Moon circled a raging sun anew, kept quiet until he spoke first. Their next child, the Sun Prince, descended from the heavens to become our ancestor. The end. And our leech child sibling, exiled to its mother's salty low tides, teaching itself to speak, growing a spiky spine. Two. The word sun is written as two kanji, breath and child. 
the kanji for breath itself composed of two characters, self and heart. The word daughter is one kanji also composed of two kanji, woman and good. The same word as for any young woman, a neighbor or stranger, generic, interchangeable, to be distinguished only from older sister, woman and market, younger sister, woman and end, bride, woman and house, wife, woman and broom, or old woman, woman under the waves. The character for wife also denotes social position. A lady is wife followed by person, ordinary wives not being persons, or a profession, nurse, cleaning woman, midwife, prostitute, comfort woman, three, written as three kanji, consolation to master the heart, peace, a woman under a roof, wife. There is no consolation for those women whose names we mispronounce, no peace even now, no mastering a heart bound and gagged, for the word accounts for no daughter, sister, mother, not even a generic young, good woman. The word ancestor includes no woman. How is it that we're still learning to draw breath, a lung full of burning coal, to speak, to name ourselves, our daughters? And these are three excerpts from a prose poem sequence titled Mother Tongues and Other Untravelings. I have no sense of direction and it embarrasses my mother. She denies any family resemblance. I never learned to navigate, to translate forward motion into the pale grids of road maps. Though as a child, I loved the miniature geography of atlases and globes, for it was easy to know where the distant places were. It was where we were that I misunderstood, in a flashing maze of street names and storefronts, traffic circles, on and off ramps. I might remember a sharp left turn or if the road curved as it climbed. What I don't understand is relative location, where each place is from where you are or where I've just come from, how to articulate sequence of movement. I am here. You are there. I won't know the way back. Down the wide gray corridor, we're leaving the hospital I hate. My mother is pregnant with my sister. I know with no memory of her being big or slow limbed because she no longer holds my hand. I'm old enough, almost five. When we pass the kiosk with candy and magazines, I do not look longingly the bright red tins of caramels. But as we come out into the blue November day, out of habit, I reach up and find a stranger's hand. Reeling with rage, I fly back down the corridor to the waiting room. Green vinyl benches and slippered feet, canes, nurses' shoes, disinfectant stinging. She always said to wait by the exit if I got lost. No running, but I'm all gone already, rounding the corner nearly knocking into her. Where have you been? We say to each other, as if in a game at mirrors. I walked out with a stranger. I thought it was you. It was me. You were with me. I don't know why I mistook her for another, only how sure I was. I don't know if she's forgiven me, only that even then I delighted in my mistake, not knowing my mother or the girl who took her hand away and ran, motherless and nameless, back to her. She writes on my birthday and at New Year's, otherwise rarely, I do not complain. My mother's letters come with boxes of food or clothes I do not need, are even more formal than my grandmother's. A lesson in letter writing, begin with the greeting appropriate for the season, Something different for mid-April and for late April as the cherry blossoms fade and the leaves come in. For early and mid-June, June, as hues of green deepen with the plum rains. Assume the same weather for the other, 
that they are not far apart. Inquire after her health, even though you know already that she eats too little meat. Note the polite closing address to match the opening, the honorific after even the daughter's name. Her briefest note has a beginning and an end, a sense that something substantial has been said. They come to me as postcards from a distant place of motherhood, written in a foreign tongue like weather we do not share. I recognize only the plainness of her signature, the abbreviated Chinese character for mother, like a thumbprint seal. And the last poem is called Grief. The first grief is without memory or sound, an absence guessed at, of one barely glimpsed, a pale hand, a red candy pen. The second grief is a wrenching out of my first grade classroom across the long night of the Pacific in my stomach churning turbulence, a wrenching of my mother from my side into her own mother's arms, of a single wail from their throats, a ragged tearing sound that I would recognize years later in the rending of black gauze pinned to my breast. A wrenching of my mother into someone unfamiliar, someone's daughter, like me, bereft. The third was mine to impart to my father, calling from a payphone on his way home from a business trip. With my mother at the hospital, I am left to say the words, your father is gone. To listen to the rushing silence of clattering rails, his orphan breath between us. But news of the last was kept from me until after the funeral, lest I attempt to traverse oceans in a misguided show of grief and hold up the ashes for I had no right to grieve. The wayward granddaughter 9,000 miles away who'd been forgiven her shortcomings again and again and still failed to learn her place. Thank you so much. Oh my God, thank you so much. Let me move the pins around here to find, oh, there you are. <laughs> Hi, Felicia. <laughs> Hi, Adam. Uh, it's such a pleasure uh, to introduce our last reader for tonight, Felicia Zamora, who is author of six books of poetry, including the incredibly new Hot Off the Presses, I Always Carry My Bones, which was winner of the 2020 Iowa Poetry Prize. She's also author of Quotient, uh, Body of Render, which won the 2018 Benjamin Saltman Award from Red Hen Press. She is an assistant professor of English at the University of Cincinnati, where she teaches poetry and creative writing. And she's also the associate poetry editor for the Colorado Review. And so happy to have you tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. <clears throat> and thank you, Ivelisse, and also Boston Review for hosting all of us. Um, I got to say, it's really intimidating going last with the fire that these artists have brought to the, <laughs> tonight. Um, uh, I, am, I am honored, I'm beyond honored to share space with all of you. Um, each one of those pieces were coring and gut wrenching and simultaneously so necessary. Um, especially now in, in this time. And as we are carving our, a new canon uh, with our voices inside of it. So thank you all for, for sharing your art today. I, I am gonna jump right in. I'm gonna read the piece from the Ancestor edition as well as a brand new piece that I also think fits really well with these themes. Meditation on lines. Water takes the path of least resistance. Any competent plumber spouts this tried and true logic. Water disobeys. Water wants what water wants. Water claims and claims. If you live in the desert long enough, you become watchful of water. Water makes up 83% of lungs, 74% of brain and heart. Tuning fork of organs. Protective 
even our watery bones. You meet the saguaro and touch your clavicle in kinship, what you can lug around, how roots tendril inside a body. You wonder how long before the spikes and spindles evolve you. Before I was a cell, I was a whisper of a cell from another cell, a longing. Our fingers between the chain linked fence, our silhouettes cast into pools before our bodies. Water glistens mercury in moonlight. Our skinny limbs under layers peeling onto cement. Under the diving board, you entered me up to knuckles. My frame squirms in the chlorine. You bring your finger to your nose. You don't smell like a dirty taco. And I see my muscles constrict along your shoulder blades. Your frame pulls out of the wet. Count 499 seconds. The time for light to leave the sun and hit earth. About eight minutes. We label this number one one astronomical unit. We define, and from our definitions, causality and abundance. The psychologist duo, Dr. Susan Fisk and Dr. Shelley Taylor coined us cognitive misers, our brain tendrils and pathways not unlike water, in search of fossil, of ease. Why scale the redwood when the stream carries our bulbous bodies in gentle sway? Nothing about the human body suggests effortlessness. After the plumber augers the main sewer line, he stands on the basement steps and says, you seem like clean people, and continues his story about a slumlord who had 15 Latinos living in a basement knee deep in feces. He groans a chuckle. My organs flinch and my cells swell. My ears fill. I'm 15 again underwater, lungs in burn, and his voice muffles away as I sink further below surface. Perhaps Fisk and Taylor got it wrong. The body made to act in, suggesting environment, and in turn be acted upon, suggesting relationship. We define to feel whole. We define to use the tongue and teeth and mandible and epiglottis to construct home in a language full of gaps, a language that at times despises us. Lungs and throat and air swirl and a voice emerges. Amiri Baraka said context is most dramatically social. Our definitions fail in the linear. Think of the zigzags, the rounded curves of any context filtered through veils of haze in our hippocampus. Did we forget the circulatory systems of veins, arteries, vessels, and nerves twisting inside of us? Maggots collect in a tiny inlet of plastic filled with water after 22 hours of rain. Half of the cream cylindrical bodies float still. The other half writhe and circle the dead. If design exists here, frost, what horrid spell cast. Light bends by itself. In 94.36 million miles, the sun's rays reach our pupils. Any physics textbook tells us light travels in a straight line. Yet now we know light bends by itself. Light travels in curves without external influence. Our walking circuitous solar systems under flesh. A lesson in windows. Corneas hold the power of refraction. The cornea bends rays through the pupil to enter us. The face, a camera, and our irises, shutters. Collection built in our compositions. Ciliary muscles mold the lens's shape, bend here, flatten there to focus light and images on the retina. The rods and cones of us in photoreceptive cells, 
how a definition bends to desired shape. Fenestra in the brain, the lungs, the throat. Open the transom. Breathe. Women develop complete sets of cells. I developed from ovum living inside my mother's ovary while inside my grandma's womb. I begin immature cell from immature ovum, ovum inside a womb. I am a woman of a woman of a woman. Interior ghost and in haunt. You take me to the edge of nothing. No longer pomposite for your butchery. I wring my shins and torso and spine and forearm, collect my own fluids, drink. Uh, and the second piece um, is new. It wasn't in Ancestors edition. It's actually um, a sonnet from a crown of sonnets that I have been working on. Um, and so this, this actually is, I believe the fourth sonnet in this sequence. Um, from Crown of Invisibility. Mind astray and whose skin color, whose blood gets exposed in the bare violence of shootings. A nation sits on its ass on gun control. Eight more people murdered in Indianapolis, just weeks after the shooting at a Boulder King Supers just a week after massacres at three spas in Atlanta. A nation sits on its ass, ignores the crowds filling Logan Square Park with cries for Adam Toledo, cries for justice for all black and brown people killed at the hands of police. A nation sits laminating an open wound, vulnus scopularium anatomic site of injury, repeats in stagnation, repeats in stagnation, repeats in stagnation, 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 anatomic site. In AD 79, Vesuvius erupted volcanic avalanches, baked humans to death. Cranial cavity fragments show a brain turned to glass. 24 million minds on fire. A sharp dawn rises. Thank you. Oh my God, Felicia, thank you so much. Let me, um, let me just remove some of these pins. Um, and I can make it so that also everyone can um, unmute themselves and start their own video. Um, and if you want to switch to a uh, grid view that way, you can see everybody. I just wanna thank our readers again. It was such a phenomenal night. And also uh, thank our incredible ASL interpreters, Selena and Susan, who've been working <laughs> so hard all night. Uh, creative writing is really, really hard to do. And, uh, and it's just been phenomenal to have them. This is always the hardest part of these Zoom events, I find, is that I, I want to be in the same room with everyone at the end. And it's just so hard to have to just click to end the meeting, but uh, thank you to everybody for being here. Um, it's such a privilege to share this space and to hear your work. And um, I, I don't know, I think, I think we just say good night, but take good care, everybody. <laughs> uh, be well, stay in touch, and, uh, and please keep reading Boston Review. Definitely head over to our website, check out what we're doing. There's a lot of amazing content there. Um, and, uh, and it's always just great to know that you're reading and supporting. Um, so please keep in touch, keep reading. Good night, everybody. Stay safe. Bye. <laughs>